What's up, guys? Alex Contreras alongside Eli Sussman. Welcome to another episode of Marlins Barbecue. Today, we got another special guest here at the barbecue. We've been hot lately, huh? We had uh, Joe Fasaro join us. We had Andy Slater. And now we have, ladies and gentlemen, with us, Paul Severino. Paul, welcome to the barbecue. What's going on? How are you? Now, I know that uh, I know Joe does some barbecuing and grilling and smoking. Uh, does Andy do it, too? Do we Andy's, know? And Andy, Andy, we had a, a really cool podcast. And actually, Mr. Slater is all about barbecues, but he's, all right. pretty, he's all about whining and dining as well. So okay. you, you chop it up with him. He's got a good taste, good steaks. All right. Because I got he's good at eating the barbecue. Yeah, I don't perfect. know how much he does himself. Yeah, I, I've got I've got three grills in the back. It's a long story, but I've got three grills in the back. So I'm I'm all about it myself. All, all charcoal or what? No, I've got uh, one gas. And then I've got two smokers. One was a vertical smoker that I'm, uh, if you guys are interested, I could make you a good deal on that one. Um, I just, I wanted to move back to like a normal grill uh, shape and size. So then I ended up getting a different grill. So now I've got like two wood pellet smoker types, one vertical that's up for uh, auction and then uh, one gas grill and one uh, regular wood pellet grill shape grill. And that's not, and believe it or not, that's not even the long story of it. So I shortened that, and it was still long and and boring. So there you go. <laughs> yeah, we have Paul. We have a lot of mutual listeners between fish stripes and a uh, fish across the pond, and so I know with that conversation, you went about two hours long with Peter. Yeah, Pratt. with with this one, will be a little bit more concise. If Peter's but, uh, listening, I'm going to blame that whole thing on him because he was just asking too good of questions. And then I just start rambling. And that and the fact that, um, well, I've worked for two months out of the last 18. So I've got a lot of words built up. I'm just trying to get them all out. I feel you. Sometimes, <laughs> I, I, sometimes I find myself talking in the mirror. <laughs> like a little therapy, you know? Anyway, so what you, what, how's, your, how's your off season been? What have you, you been up to? Uh, other than grilling, um, yeah, I mean, I think probably just like everybody else, it's been uh, it's been pretty low key, not uh, not traveling too much, um, not going out to dinner, so doing a lot of the uh, doing a lot of the grilling at home here. But um, you know, it's been it's been nice. You know, this is uh, going into my fourth year uh, doing Marlins games, and um, you know, even though I'd, I'd worked at ESPN, so that's weekends and nights and crazy hours and holidays and stuff, and and MLB Network, same thing, nights, weekends, holidays, the whole thing. Um, this particular job, which I, which I love, even though you have those six months in a, in a normal world, six months where you're pretty much working every single day, um, you get six months where you are just a dad and a husband and, um, and an intern here at the house. So, you know, you, you just, you get to enjoy that time. Um, you know, my son is, is, is 10 and a half years old, so he's a, a fun age. And so it's, it's um, again, trying to find the silver lining and all of the stuff that's been going on. And so I've been able to spend a lot more time at home with him and my wife and, uh, and the little dog Homer, um, not named after Homer Simpson, but rather a baseball reference there. So, uh, so I've got, got to spend a little extra time at, at home, but um Gearing up for the season to start, I, I think uh, everybody wants to kick me out of the house a little bit and get their space back. <laughs> I want to touch so many bases with what, what, what you said. I want to talk about. Uh, you, you say you like grilling, right? Yeah. You just grill for your for your for your family, like your wife and your kid, or like can you just like take it to another level and you can like all right, I can grill for like fifteen people because I feel like it's a whole different type of pressure. Like I, I can it absolutely crack one, you crack one open and it's like damn. What the hell did I get myself into now? Now I gotta worry about 15 people and right. I'm trying to cook the steak at medium. And it's like, can I get this well done? It's like, well, why you want a well done steak? <laughs> <laughs> right. Go to go to Ruth's Chris or Outback or something if you wanted a specific temperature, but you're getting it whatever I can get it at. Um, yeah, no, it's, so far it's been uh just the family and uh and some close friends. Um, but even even then some close friends who I don't think would be too upset with a, an overcooked or oversalted steak or uh or chicken wings or something like that they wouldn't be too judgy um it's still a lot of pressure to make sure that they're that they're satisfied with the meal at the end of it all but um i'm working on it. i i haven't gone too crazy i tried a couple of briskets that um that's an advanced that's an advanced skill the brisket uh haven't mastered it yet 
still working on that. Um, figured out a solid three, two, one method. I didn't figure it out, but I used everybody else's three, two, one method on the ribs. So the last time I made ribs were really, really good. Uh, chicken wings are pretty good. What did I make the other day? Oh, I just, uh, boneless, skinless thighs. I smoked them for like a half an hour and then I grilled them on the open flame, uh, for like 10 or 15 minutes. Exquisite, exquisite. Dang, we so. got you. Any, any, any evidence, any pictures, bro? Yeah, it's all gone. I ate it all. <laughs> no, I'm, I think I've actually posted a few. I, that's the thing. In the off season, I lead such a boring life that like the only thing that I, I, I post about, and I feel bad because I, 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 I hope, I don't know, that I have enough, some followers, I guess, that people are interested in some of the stuff that I'm doing that's not baseball related, but it seems like that's the only thing that's of any excitement whatsoever is, uh, is me on the grill. So I've posted a few uh videos or pictures uh of the grill the last few months on my instagram but that's been the extent of it hey uh you mentioned you had your dog your dog's name is homer yeah i got a dog, my, I got a dog myself his name is strike so, <laughs> how cool nice. is that nice nice how'd you come up with homer's name uh we were trying he he's a boston terrier he's 14 years old he's still going strong um as strong as a, a boston terrier can at 14 years old but um we knew early on that he was kind of goofy so we wanted a kind of a silly, goofy name. And, um, you know, I've obviously always been a baseball fan. So I figured out, I think my wife found it somewhere. And I, and I it probably came up as you know, Homer, the, the philosopher or whatever he is, um, <laughs> or Homer Simpson. But I was like, no, Homer works. That's cool. And, uh, and, it, it, and you know what? It all worked out because the home run sculpture uh, that's now outside Marlins Park is also named Homer. So it works out. It works out well. If I ever uh, I haven't settled on one yet. I don't know if I ever will, but like an actual signature home run call. But if I ever do um, some inside info here, it might include the word Homer just uh, as a as a two pronged effect to satisfy a little Marlins uh, stuff outside there. And then also a little shout to Shout to the pooch. We'll see. <laughs> I like it. I like it. How do you, so how do you come up with a home run call, right? Because, like, <laughs> you're just caught up in the moment. Like, you don't want to take away from the moment, right? right. But it's like, well, I, I like how you how you stamped your, your it's a Marlins win. Can we get it? Can you do it better than me? Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> it's a Marlins win. Yeah, no, I, um, that was the thing. It, it's interesting, I think, because I got a lot of questions early on uh, when I first got the job. Um, about, you know, what's your home run call going to be? And I, I had put some thought into it, um, but more so like long before I got the job, like, you know, if I'm ever lucky enough to get a big league job and have a team and, you know, call 300 home runs a year, like, would I have a home run call? And I thought in the back of my mind, I, I probably would, because it seems like everybody does. Um, but then nothing really hit me uh, that was all that, Cause you, you want to be catchy and you want to be cool, but then you don't want it to like be overly cheesy because you know, heaven forbid there's a three Homer game and it's like, you got to hear the same thing over and over and over again. So it's like, if, if it wears out, it's welcome, then you're kind of stuck with it. And then it sucks and you suck and it's all it's just, the whole thing sucked. So, um, so between that and, you know, not every home run is the same, you know, some are no doubters, high arcing home runs and some are low line drives and some just get over the wall and you never really know. So it's like, okay, how can you, how can I, not you as a, as a broadcaster, but how can I make it, you know, neutral enough that it would fit all those categories. And I just, I never really settled on anything. And I think that, um, and I think it just kind of allowed me the freedom to go with, whatever the, the, the moment is, you know, like last year, for example, um, I don't know if it was great or not, but I've heard it in a couple of places, the Starling Marte home run, his first game, you know, like it, it was just a natural thing where, um, you know, Todd and I were talking, it was late in the game and who's going to come up with the big hit and, you know, welcome back for the eighth inning. And here's the guys that are due up. And Holly says something about, I think, I don't know who it was. Maybe he said Isan Diaz. Somebody said, I, maybe it'll be Isan Diaz that comes up with a big hit. We'll see. And then the next pitch, I said, then maybe it'll be Marte. And then crack, maybe it'll be Marte. Oh, it's definitely Marte. So it just kind of like, it was just a natural organic thing. And I think if you, um, again, not you and the collective broadcaster, but me, if, if I 
uh, allow myself that freedom to just kind of go with the moment, then it becomes a little bit more natural. And, um, and I'll be honest with the, it's a Marlins win thing. Again, it, it's, it's not exactly rocket science or brain surgery by any stretch, but how that kind of came up was, um, a, uh, mistake, I guess. I don't know if that's a, a strong word or not, but it was just, uh, just a mishap. It was a game, uh, my first year that uh, the Marlins were, were winning and they had, they were on defense and they had a runner was on first and they end up inducing a double play ball and whatever it was. And I say, you know, uh, whoever was playing second base that year, Rojas to let's just say Rojas to Diaz to Cooper ball game. And, you know, we went uh, and the game was over and this, that, or whatever. And my producer said, Hey, uh, just a heads up. He goes, I know that that was really natural, but just a heads up, uh, you know, Rich, we all love Rich Waltz, um, a phenomenal broadcaster in his own right. But that w- he would say ball game at the end of a game. And that was kind of his signature thing. And I wasn't trying to steal it. I just uh, just came again, just came naturally. And I and I said, oh, all right, I, you know, I don't want to step on his toes if that's his thing. And I want to, you know, make my own uh, footprint here. So I said, all right, I should come up with something that uh that just takes a puts it all into muscle memory and just come up with something that i can say at the end of every game that can be my own and i just settled on on that and the the words are obviously pretty simple um but it's so it's more of an inflection thing so it's a nuance uh i guess with the emphasis on it's and and whatever and i thought well if that ever catches on you know, maybe it, it's short, it's sweet, it's quick, it's simple. Nobody can get that upset at it. It's not too corny. Uh, you can put it on a t-shirt. If those guys at Fish Stripes ever want to put stuff on a t-shirt, they can do that. Um, you know, put it on the score, whatever it is, just like it, it was simple and, and whatnot. So that's where that came from. But uh, yeah, it was it was born out of a, out of a respectful mistake that I made. Uh, so that that's where that came from. Honestly, I understand what they're saying, where the producers are coming from and all that. But as a, a, like, I feel like it's natural. Like you should be able to say ball game wherever you're at. And and I know Rich was just here before yeah. you got here. Um, but I think like, like fellow Ramirez, right? Like the great Spanish voice of the Marlins, like he left a big mark on this, on this community. Sure. And his, and his wingman was Yiki Quintana, the, the current voice, right? So Yiki like says, things like fellow would say just to keep his tradition alive right and i think like sometimes when i'm doing stuff in spanish like the fellow will come out of me or the yiki will come out of me or like a combination of all these guys and i'm not doing it to steal like their thunder i'm just doing it just because like the inner fan in me that's that's what we always like transmit like now it's like we always say it's a marlin's win you know what i'm saying like we get amped up about it and it's right, not like right. because we're trying to take severino swag is just it's just like things which is a real thing by the way severino swag is a real thing it's sweeping (laughs) it's sweeping the nation it's sweeping up the barbecue too (laughs) hey so uh, with with what alex was saying there though it's about it's flat it's supposed to be flattering that we i think when you're on this job for a while as i really you have been now for several years that you are leaving an impression on the viewers that hear your voice and your style every single game as so many fans do they get in that routine where they're always listening to to your calls and it rubs off on them and yeah. uh but it, uh, it's the fact that they're imitating you or influencing your word choice on theirs it's uh yeah it, it, i think it's it, yeah. a big endorsement of the job that you've done so far it, it absolutely is and it's flattering and i appreciate it and you know i i uh you know, obviously we have broadcast a lot of the Marlins games. They haven't been on, on other networks all that much um, in the last few years, but whether it was, uh, I think it was like a YouTube game last year that, that we didn't broadcast. And then obviously the postseason, uh, I think it was ESPN and Fox that had the games. Um, you know, people were, were calling for it at, at the end of a win. So that was pretty cool. And, and, and it is, it's, it's flattering and it's humbling for sure. Um, when a, when a fan does it, that's, I, I love it. I appreciate every second of it, but I think that um, just as a, as a broadcaster, you don't ever want to feel like you're stepping on someone else's signature call of any sort, you know, um, just trying to think of a, another signature call. You just, you just wouldn't want to do it just kind of out of respect to, to that person. And, and it, listen, I, I've, I've talked to Rich what, enough. I, I respect the hell out of him. So would it, would the politics 
of it be like sometimes like I don't know if this is a good comparison, but sometimes like a player will come into a town and they'll request a number. Uh, the last one I can remember that requested a number that was like off limits was uh, what Miguel Cabrera when he went from 20 to 24, he had to ask Tony Perez, right? So like I'm sure he had to ask for his grace to get it or whatever. Would it would it be like something ludicrous for an announcer to call another announcer and be like, yo, can I, do I have your blessings to, you know, like, Are you asking like, if Rich would have let me say ball game if I bought him a Lamborghini or something like that? <laughs> I don't know about that. At least invite him over to, you know, get him some ribs or something, smoke him up some ribs. <laughs> no, I, I, I don't. Um, I, I think for me, it's just like uh, it's kind of like an unwritten thing. Like there's there's so many words out there. I have a decent vocabulary. I should be able to come up with something that's my own. And um, and and that's that's pretty much it. And, and I would. Uh, uh, yeah, that, that was, that was it again. It was, it was, it, and the, uh, let me clarify too. Well, the producer wasn't upset about it. He's just like, Hey, just be careful. Cause that was kind of his thing. And you know, if you're trying to make a mark for yourself, you might want your own thing. And he was just giving me a heads up. It was uh, I I'm guessing my producer probably doesn't re remember why it came up. So it was not a big deal whatsoever, but you know, again, it's just a, just a respect thing. That's all. Talk to us about, uh, you used to work at ESPN, right? Yeah. Uh, how long did you work at ESPN for? Uh, I was there for five years, and that was my first paid job out of college. But I actually grew up in Bristol. So um, it was, to me, it, and I say this with all due respect, too, it was always the TV station down the street for me. Like when I was 10, 11 years old, and we'd go on summer camp trips, we'd tour ESPN uh, every summer. And I'd walk through the halls, and we'd do stop and chat with uh, Stuart Scott and check out the studios and stuff like that. So um, I, I think I was just young and naive, but I was never, uh, I was intimidated, but never overly intimidated. I always thought like, you know what, I've, I've walked these halls before I can, I can handle this. I get in a, in a sense, it's almost like the, um, the major leaguer whose dad played and you get to spend time in the clubhouse. And as you grow and you end up getting into the, into a major league clubhouse and play, as a major leaguer, once you get older, um, sure, you're still trying to catch up with 98 miles an hour. Um, but at the same time, you have some experience doing it and it takes a little bit of the edge off. But um, when the red light goes on and you know that you're 23 years old and broadcasting to the country on, you know, uh, probably the most recognizable sports network in the world, um, it, your blood gets flowing for sure, whether you've walked those hallways or not as a 10 year old, but, um, but it was, uh, it was awesome to work there and, and certainly worked with uh, some of the best broadcasters and, and producers and sports television minds in the country. And, um, and at such a young age, that was a benefit too, because it, you know, a lot of guys, whether they knew it or not, were showing me how, how to carry yourself as a professional again, same deal um, as that, that kid minor leaguer um, or, or, kid whose dad's a major leaguer um you know you just watch how these guys carry themselves and how they prepare and um and it was uh, it was good for me to to really help me set a foundation for for where my career would go and then that that then you would make the jump to the mlb network and, and yeah. i was i was discussing this with eli how mlb network like it came i think it was founded in like 2009 2010 something like that and uh, you joined them in, in 20 2011 and i was just telling eli i was like man i used to be so amped up as a kid to watch highlights on ESPN on baseball tonight. Right. Like if they would sneak in, it would, uh, 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 right. So you, you would hope that they did for the play. And then it's like, all right, oh, we got a web gem. You're going to see it. And then like myself personally, like I, I, I would enjoy <clears throat> watching the Marlins web gems more than like the sports center top plays like sports centers is awesome because you saw all the sports but it was just just baseball and then when mlb right. network said all right we're we got our own network like mlb has their own network holy cow like they're pulling all the big guys like from espn too and then it's like wow to talk to, like i was super amped up about that how like it was it a no-brainer for you like how did that happen uh yeah i mean i i, I certainly didn't make the decision to hire myself. So it was, uh, for me, it was a no brainer to audition and hopefully do a good job. Um, but yeah, I mean, it was, uh, baseball's always been my first love. Um, and it, in, and it's, and I always wanted to, 
you know, grow up and, and be the voice of a major league baseball team. So uh, working at ESPN, obviously there was some play by play in my job description there, but a lot of it was studio stuff, um, which was also good. Um, but then going to MLB network, it was like, okay, well, even though, you know, there's kind of like two career, there's a lot of career paths, but two general career paths uh, to get to the a big league booth would be, you know, either go down the minor league route and, and, and work your way up through the minor leagues the same way a player would, or hopefully um, make a big enough name for yourself, I guess, that um, if a major league job opened up, people kind of know how you work. And, um, you know, obviously you have to get some, some experience in calling games along the way, but um, just kind of go about it that way. And um, that was not necessarily a plan it wasn't like, okay, I'm, I'm going to go that studio route and see where it takes me. Um, you know, it's, it's just like anybody out of college. It's like, wherever that first job takes you, then you have to adjust from there. Um, and obviously ESPN was great. And then uh, once the MLB network opened up, it was, you know, two hours down the road for me. And I just had to move the family down and um, obviously a lot of sacrifices to make that happen. But, um, but we did and spent seven years there and, uh, and, and that was great too. Cause you know, then I, I became kind of part of the, the baseball world and the baseball family. And, um, you know, ultimately hope that that would help, uh, to, to land me a, a big league job. Um, just having worked around baseball and, and met with a lot of different people and, and talked with a lot of different players and managers and GMs along the way. And, uh, just kind of, again, just make those connections and, um, so it's, it's always cool, you know, back in, back in the old days when we got to hang out by the batting cage, um, you know, when you'd go up and like, uh, I remember the, probably the, the biggest name to ever do it is Nolan Arenado. Like I went up to him my first year, it was the, uh, uh, God, I think it was, yeah, it was my first year down in, in Miami and uh, went up to him and I said, hey, Paul Severino with the Marlins and, and he recognized me from MLB Network. And he's like, oh yeah, you're, you're with the Marlins now, huh? And I said, yeah. So, you know, it was, it's like, wow, I, I guess it, uh, you know, the player, we knew that the players watched, but to be able to differentiate me from 12 other guys that, uh, that, that are hosts and anchors there was pretty cool. And, um, you know, and then I, obviously every time I, I see Nolan around the cage uh, anywhere, actually, I, 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 um, I emceed the gold glove awards in 2019, a few months before the world turned upside down and, of course, Nolan won a gold glove and he was there in New York for, um, I shouldn't say I emceed, I'm giving myself too much credit. I was the voice of God. So I would say, you know, the, the, this starts in 10 minutes, please get to your seats. And then once they went through the, um, once they went through the, the award ceremony, they said, all right, here, the, the, the winner is Nolan Arenado. And then they go to a voice, a, a video package. And I was voicing it over live. This is Nolan Arenado's seventh gold glove and nobody's ever won that many and blah, blah, blah. So it was Joe Piscopo who, who emceed it. He's a little more famous than me, but um, anyway, long story long, uh, you know, I, I bumped into Nolan there too. And I said, Hey, what's up? It's good to see you. Hey, how you doing? And, you know, we, and we just chat. So it was just, uh, it was cool again, to be able to make those connections. And it, and it makes it a lot easier when you see a guy like Arenado only, you know, five, six, seven times during a season. Um, and he doesn't owe me anything, but to just sit there and chat with him for a few minutes. And that might give you a couple of nuggets through the broadcast and, um, you know, hopefully impart a little bit of a connection back to the fan that, um, you know, whether he's the guy's playing for the Marlins or any other team that these are still, uh, still human beings and they still have a story to tell and they're still, uh, you know, generally good, good people. And, um, you know, that's kind of, that's kind of what we do too, is just humanize them all a little bit. So it, it, it makes it easy when you have the connection so that you can do that can't believe you had a connection to Nolan Arenado and you kept it to yourself. Like you could have called them and told them, yo, you don't want to be a Marlin. <laughs> he went to the Cardinals. I, I'm not saying I got a cell phone. I said, I bump in around the cage. <laughs> I'm saying bump into him. Hey, you never thought about being out here in South Florida with us. Nacolaita, how we drink coffee. <laughs> I'm joking. I'm You're joking. giving me too much credit, man. I don't make personal <laughs> moves. <laughs> oh, man. Paul, as cool as that, that must have been with Arnado and kind of coming full circle from actually being like in the same field as him. It's probably even more surreal to be the broadcaster for a Marlins team that's managed by Don Mattingly, a guy you grew up rooting for as a oh, Yankees yeah. fan in Connecticut. 
And you probably saw this coming as the year was going on. We knew what this team had to overcome in 2020 and that Mattingly deservedly was getting a lot of praise for the job he was doing with all these interchanging parts, all these strangers that were popping onto his team so that they could fill out a roster and compete. And then when they had that success to get them in contention, how unbelievable that was. So you saw it coming, but officially we got the news in November that he was named National League Manager of the Year. Uh, so just your thoughts on how how proud you must be or uh, all, whatever emotions you have seeing him succeed as a manager after, of course, watching him be one of the better players in baseball back in the day. Now having this really long and successful second act in a yeah. different part of baseball. For sure. And I think that, um, I, listen, a World Series win would be great for him. But I, for me, I, I thought that he was a borderline Hall of Famer as a player. Um, as you mentioned, he's had a terrific second act as a manager. And I think a, uh, a manager of the year award with a team that, um, those on the outside thought, uh, overachieved last year. I know that the expectations within the Marlins family w- were, were high and are always going to be high. Um, but some of those quote unquote experts probably didn't expect much, but to see what, uh, you know, last year is my third year. So the first two years I was there. Marlins ended up losing over 200 games and, and every day uh, Donnie was accessible and every day Donnie was accountable and every day Donnie was teaching something. I mean, never was it a situation in, you know, early August when the team was way out of it that, you know, he blew off the media or uh, ever gave anybody any sort of attitude or it just didn't want to talk or anything. He was always willing to say something and, and, to us, but always just, again, I do a lot of watching when I'm around the cage for batting practice and just, you know, see how people interact and stuff like that. And Donnie's just such a good teacher. And I think that, um, I think he'll tell you this too, is that he's one of the thrills that he gets in being a manager is not just drawing up the lineup card, but being able to teach. He loves doing it. Um, And, you know, with such a young team, uh, that they've had these last few years or, uh, you know, major league inexperience type of team that they've had the last few years. He's been able to do that a lot. Um, and in part, just his boundless wisdom on these guys. And, um, you know, I, I, that's, that's been fun to watch. And that's been, what's been so rewarding is that all of those guys that, you know, may have had some ups and downs in, in, in 18 and in 19, that, that something clicked for them in 20, or they found a way to contribute, even though it might've been a different role than they had the previous two years was, was all really for me due to his, his leadership. And the fact that he had a bunch of guys that were able to buy into the, the, the plan and the belief and the mindset that, that he, and, you know, the rest of the, the coaching staff and front office kind of imparted and, um, yeah, I mean, you know, I said it toward the end of last year. Jace Tingler did a phenomenal job in San Diego, and David Ross a great job in Chicago as first-year managers under you know the the strangest of of conditions. But yeah, it, for me, it was a no-brainer. It was a no-brainer that Don Mattingly was the manager of the year last year uh, in the National League, and uh, and deservedly so. And um, you know, I, I think again, just just to see the way that you know, he, uh, he keeps everybody together and there have been some, some down times in terms of wins and losses. There have been some uncertain times, obviously in, in the first week of last season, uh, probably at the top of that list. And, um, he's, he's been able to weather the storm, man. And he's been uh, so much fun to watch. And, uh, yeah, I, I love the guy. And I think that, uh, I think that the Marlins and their fans are, are happy to have him. Man, I uh, I remember when I met Derek Jeter at a, at a fan fest, the first fan fest after they acquired the team. And I remember I told him, thank you so much for, for buying the Marlins. You know, it, it's about time that somebody bought the team that cares about the team. And, and it feels good knowing that we're not going to be the laughing stock of the league anymore. You know, and like, and, and yeah. just telling him that he was, it, it sunk. Like, I know he, he was like, hey, thank you. You know, and, and, I, and I, right now we're at a point where it's like, man, it feels really good to be a Marlins fan. Yeah, for, absolutely. We, we, we had tough years, like really, really tough years. Everybody came at us again because they blew it up. But uh, everybody that bought into the plan and understood everything that this this front office is doing, like it's it's flourishing. Like it's, it's 
blossoming like the whole plan yeah. and uh we're, we're really happy like with everything that's going on um i wanted to make a transition real quick and talk to you about your kid you were t- telling us that your kid's around 10 years old right now right 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 yep so so it's it's beautiful that you get to enjoy him during the off season like is it are you starting to notice like his talents or what's his curiosities leading into like i'm sure at that age you know there's something that you used to like maybe you used to watch sports or something like that like uh like wrestling for example like i i used to be a big wwf fan and i would find myself like like imitating the narrators and stuff like that you know like just like you would imitate narrators in, in baseball right and then, and then i'm just curious like at that age something that was t- tickling in your head where you, did you find yourself you know narrating paul paul Cerver, you know wwf or something like that you know that's like- where that's where it started for me honestly like when i was three or four years old and um you know i had like the little wrestling figures and stuff i didn't I, geez i could barely tell the difference between hulk hogan and the iron sheik but i could you know <laughs> sit there and and, and and like announce the wrestlers and oh off the top row body slamming and that's honestly like that's where it started and then it it, it kind of morphed into you know, playing some, some video games and baseball video games or Madden or whatever it was. And just like, you know, sitting there and like, Oh, this is fun. And this is cool. And like turn the announcers off. Don't tell Vaskersian that I used to do that on the show, but um, you know, just turn the announcers off and like call it, call the game. And uh, that's, yeah, that's where it kind of started for me. And uh, it was probably around my son's age that, that I started to do that. He's uh He's not announcing game probably because he wants to listen to me, or at least that's what I tell myself, but he's not muting the TV uh, to do it. But um, there were a few times last year when, you know, I, I would do a little prep work in the morning or whatever. And I was looking at my scorecard. He's like, he's going through, he's like, can you print out a scorecard for me so I can keep track tonight? And I was like, yeah, sure. So for like a solid week, it was every night and I'm showing him how to score and everything else. And he goes, you know, when you get to work and you get the lineup, send me the lineup. And he, I said, so he sent him my lineup card. That's all filled out. I sent it to him and he, he sends me a picture back and it's all filled out. So it was, uh, it was pretty cool. And you know, that, that's one of the things my, I think it was my first year, my wife was up in the booth uh, with my son and she took one of the, my favorite pictures that I have was like from the back of the booth, looking out toward the field. And I'm down on like the bottom row where, where we, where we have our little perch. And then my son was like up top kind of looking over and she took the picture over his shoulder, watching me watch the game. And it was, uh, I, I just, I just love that. Cause it's, um, you know, there's only 30 people that have these jobs and it's a job that I uh, worked at and hope that eventually I would, I would get. And, you know, hopefully I don't screw it up too, too bad where I get to enjoy this for, uh, hopefully the rest of my career and, um, and be able to share these experiences with, uh, with my wife and my son. And, and uh, it's been, it's been a lot of fun because like I said, not, not many people get to do it. So it's, uh, it's been awesome. That's beautiful. You just said that you wanted to spend your whole career here as a Marley man. Yo, yo, I'm giving you a virtual hug. <laughs> my guy. You sold, you sold me. You sold me. I was thinking about, I was thinking about, I was like, yo, can I really push that button and ask like Paul, can I like, Paul, what's, what's like, what's the dream? Like what's Paul Severino trying to get at? I was like, nah, I don't want to put him in the spot like that. But you just answered that you want to be like a Marley for life, but man. Yeah. Listen, unless the PGA tour calls, and, and they want me to go on tour and play uh, in, in all the majors. And um, then, then, yeah, that would be the only thing I think I would want to leave for. But so far, I don't, I don't think my 20 some odd handicap is going to get me on the PGA tour <laughs> anytime soon. Have you, uh, have you been in touch with Holly? Yeah, we spoke uh, just the other day. Yeah, we're, uh, we, we miss each other. It's amazing how much time we all spend together. And again, in a normal season, um, it, it, it's, you know, it's just like the players, man. You know, they talk about it being a family and everything else. It, it's the same for broadcasters. And it's important that we have a, uh, a good relationship. And, um, and I think we do. Um, and I think that, uh, you know, you, you hope that you can have that chemistry on air so that people actually enjoy listening. Um, you know, they're, they're, I am smart enough to know that nobody tunes in to watch me or listen to me. They, they tune in to watch the Marlins, but if, you know, 
if Holly and I have a decent enough relationship and make each other laugh a little bit and hopefully make the people at home laugh and inform with, uh, with a stat or a nugget or an experience or two along the way, then that's all gravy. But, um, yeah, we spend a lot of time together. We sit next to each other on the planes. Uh, we usually take the same bus, uh, to the ballpark. Um, you know, we're up in the booth at the games at seven. We're probably on the road. It's a two thirty bus. So we're together from about, you know, probably three o'clock once we get up in the booth until the end of the game at 10 o'clock and the bus leaves 40 minutes after the game. So that's another 40 minutes that we're hanging out together and, uh, do it all again tomorrow. So it's, um, I take yeah. it on, I take it on an off day. At least if you guys are doing grilling, like I'm sure you're doing the grilling. Cause Holly looks like he would just burn everything. <laughs> 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 right, Eli, I tell you what, over the course of six months if there's an off day it's probably spent with each other's families i think we, we he probably gets enough of me during the season that if there's a, a monday off day i'm probably the last person he wants to see <laughs> <laughs> that's funny um let's we're see. here with paul severino tv voice of the marlins of fox sports florida very soon to be valley sports florida i guess a bunch of the questions that I we won't have time to get to all of them, but one of the unique wrinkles, obviously, of last season was the shortened schedule and fewer reps for you. Uh, as someone personally that does a lot of podcasting, if I do an hour or two or three in a week, uh, my voice starts to waver a little bit, and I'm always curious about uh, the stamina that you have to have to be on air every single night for six or seven months and, and not yeah. just the game broadcast, but little check-ins pre-game and post-game and other media responsibilities that you have to talk a lot and you have yeah. to maintain that audio quality. One of the concerns around baseball this year is with like starting pitchers coming off a shortened year, how much of a workload can we expect from them? And the expectation is with a lot of teams, the Marlins included, they're going to limit their innings because it's a difficult transition to ramp it up from 60 games to 162 like that. Uh, as a broadcaster, I'm kind of worried about you. Is there any, <laughs> is there any sort of conditioning that you have to do uh, during the off season or at least during like this particular off season that um, y- you think you're going to adjust well to going back to a full schedule for yourself? Well, I'll tell you this up until about 47 seconds ago, I hadn't even thought of it. So thanks. Uh, <laughs> it, no, no, I, uh, I, 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 I'm lucky. I think I've been okay. Um, in terms of, you know, the, the voice holding up, um, you're, you're right though. I, I, there, there are certainly in, and I have gotten this a question a few times. Um, I, I don't do really anything special. The only thing like, honestly, and it's, it's not even like for the, the work portion of it, but like, if I'm driving to work, um, maybe I'll like sing in the car and like warm the voice up that way without even know. I mean, I have a horrible voice. What you singing? Like, uh, what you singing? I'll, I'll go, I'll go all over the spectrum a little bit, but, um, honestly, all great minds do here. Here's one, right? So here's one, um, hip hop. So I try to sing or rap hip hop in a way to, that I guess would be one, one exercise in an effort to get the lips and the tongue and everything moving fast. You know, um, I will not, you haven't even asked, but I will not do <laughs> because, because I, I, uh, I have conducted an interview or two and I gave you a wide open spot right there to ask me to do it, but I will not. Uh, um, but you know, just like that, that might be like one thing just to, you know, be able to speak quickly. Cause sometimes, you know, there might be a tight game and double down on the gap in the corner and here he's going a third and Trey Hillman's going to wave him around and you start talking fast and you need to be able to enunciate and, uh, and speak clearly and, and inflect in different ways and stuff like that. So, um, yeah, I'll, I'll every once in a while I'll throw on a little bit uh, of hip hop, but yeah, I mean I'm 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 all over the map with you, music. You're doing the you're doing modern hip hop. You're doing you're going old school. Uh, probably more old school. Probably more like uh, like '90s, 2000s type. Um, I'm nearing 40, so I can't I can't keep up too too much. But yeah, I would say you know Nelly, Eminem some Tupac, some Biggie, Jay-Z, you know, the, the classics, stuff like that. So, 
Yeah, man. Come on, man. Let me hear something, man. Oh, no, <laughs> I'm, I'm, go, I'm going through a tunnel right now. You're breaking up. I can't hear <laughs> Hey, but I could definitely see that. Like, I, I, this, that's some of the things that, like, people don't really think about, like, like the whole breathing process as you're narrating, mm. like what you were talking about, there's a ball to the left field. It's right. a relay guy, you know, you're describing the whole thing. Do you just go like with one breath and it's like, all right, here's the pitch. And like, and then you just go with that whole breath or. Well, I, I think, you know, the other thing too is, and it's an adjustment that I've had to make. And I, I hope that I've made it pretty well is that in doing a game on TV is different than doing a game on a radio. Like you just need to be more efficient with your words on TV. Um, you know, for example, a, a radio call um, from Dave or Glenn might sound like, uh, you know, here comes the two one pitch and Jones swings and grounds a ball and a couple of hops to Rojas is short. He's up with it over across the diamond and Aguilar puts it away. That's the first out here in the first inning. Whereas on a TV, you don't need to paint every single portion of that. So it'd be like Sandy set and the pitch Rojas and Aguilar. There's one away. So it's the same thing. So you're a little bit more efficient with your words. Um, and it, it's just kind of cleaner that way. Um, so it's, you know, I think once you understand that, that pacing, I think that, uh, that, that can be kind of what separates, um, you know, the, the, uh, the guy who, and I've been that guy, trust me, who wants to sound like a broadcaster and then the guy who actually is a broadcaster once you figure out that, that pacing and that cadence a little bit. But, um, but yeah, I, uh, they, but, they, and to get back to Ellie's point was like the, um, so yeah, I don't, I don't do any exercises really, but just to finish the point there, like it, you, there is a different broadcaster voice. Like you don't, just sit and talk you do have to project a little bit and you know when I go back downstairs my wife will probably tell me every time you do these podcasts you always sound like super loud and you're billowing through the house and it's like yeah I don't know why I do that it's just like a natural thing anytime I feel like there's some sort of like broadcast thing going on like it just gets bigger and it just gets louder so I but normally if I like it, this is me like normally talking hey honey do you need anything at the grocery store like that's me normally talking yeah, he's very he's very Rico Suave up and close. Yeah, like right. when you, you should see him when when the world was normal. When he asked for the coffee at Marlins Park, <laughs> <laughs> uh, <un> cafecito. <laughs> por favor, un cafecito, por favor. Yeah, you're like, oh, oh, dang, Paul. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> but that was me just saving it for because in ten minutes I'd have to go. Uh, I have to go nuts. That's why. <laughs> good, good times, good normal times, man. Have you heard anything about the ice cream machine? <laughs> It's always Tough. broken. The famous, the, the, what do Marlins Park and McDonald's have in common? <laughs> the, the ice cream machine's always broke. <laughs> uh, but you know, I think we're all using it too much. That's probably what it is. The amount of times, like, it's, it's, it's sad, but the amount of times that, like, I'll be caught up in a conversation with somebody and, or, or doing my scorecard or there's a late change in the lineup or something going on, and it's like, oh, shoot, I haven't eaten dinner. And then my dinner consists of like the popcorn and the ice cream with some M&Ms in it. It's like, what kind of dinner is this? But I've done that plenty of time. Plenty hey, of time. Um, talk to me about this relationship with, with, uh, with Gef, with, with, with Dave, <laughs> Dave Gef. Go ahead. Tell me like, what's up? who's, who's like, I love the whole, like, it's a, it's like a bromance or it's like a little, I don't know who's it's like, I think about like Matt Damon and Jimmy Kimmel. Who's Jimmy <laughs> Matt Damon over here right now? <laughs> who's, uh, the diva? who's the diva? He, he uh, Glenn Geffner is the handsomer of the two. How about that? So whichever one is Matt Damon <laughs> or Ben Affleck. No, uh, he, um, he reached out to me shortly after I got the job I, and I had not, uh, met him before and, and, uh, and I appreciated that. He sent me a long text. I, I forget where he got my number from somebody, but he sent me a text and said, Hey, you know, Glenn Geffner, uh, I'm on the radio side of things, you know, uh, welcome aboard. A lot of times we get to a, to a city and a, you know, mostly on, you know, a Sunday night, we'll get to a city, we get to Atlanta at seven 30, eight o'clock, whatever it is. Um, you know, a lot of times we'll go out and grab a bite to eat and, and stuff like that. And, uh, and that's kind of how he introduced me. And then, you know, we'd always you'd go down to the field and, and chat with uh, Donnie at, at the same time and um, just exchange ideas and, and exchange broadcasting tips. And, and so the amount of the amount of 
how do you keep your notes, Glenn? And how, what's your scorecard look like, Paul? Like the amount of conversations that we've had have just been countless. And, uh, and Geff is such a pro and, um, yeah, and I, I really like him. And we, and we have a, we have a funny, silly, goofy relationship. And last year when, when everything went upside down and, and we knew that people were, were begging for some form of Marlins content. And by that, I mean, people just wanting to hear me talk. Um, we just, I, I said, Geff, what if we did like some Instagram live thing together and, and it's just you and I chit chat or, you know, in a perfect world, we get a Marlin on and talk to him in like a long form thing. And he's like, yeah, I love it. I love it. And, and so that was what probably uh, April ish, March, April ish last year that we started that. And yeah, I mean, it was, uh, it was fun for the time being. It's a lot of work. So I credit you guys with, with all the podcasts and all the content that you're putting out there. Cause it's um, you know, it, it's not just this conversation. There's a lot of pre and post production that goes into it. Um, and it's uh, it's a lot of work and we just weren't getting paid enough for that to keep it going for too long. <laughs> um, you know, I, he, I had, I had high contract demands, uh, you know, I wanted 10 million an episode. I, I wanted, I wanted Chandler Bing money on friends. Like what the, what the hell I'm doing a job here. I want to get compensated. No, uh, it, it was just, it was just a fun thing. And, you know, I think we kind of shut it down once the season was getting close to starting and um, you know, Glenn, like I said, Glenn's a true pro and, and, and I uh, would like to think that I'm the same way. So once we kind of knew when the season was starting, it was like, okay, we need to focus on, on prep here and, and our own prep and getting ready. Cause it's a 60 game season. We're not going to get many days off. Um, we just got to make sure that we're loaded for bear with our information uh, for our broadcast, which is uh, obviously where our bread is buttered. So uh, we said, all right, we, we need to, we need to stop this for now and, and focus on uh, focus on the big thing, the season itself. So, but I, I love Geff. Hey, let's focus on the season. Talk to me about these Marlins. Yeah. Yeah. It, Talk to me uh, about this. Uh, who's, who's your, who's your guy? Who, who's somebody <laughs> under the, like, imagine you're on, you're not on MLB network, but you're on Marlins barbecue. Who's right. that Marlin that the media needs to know about? Everybody knows about, hold on, before you get started, hold on. Everybody knows about <laughs> Miggy. Everybody knows about uh, Sixto, somebody that, that we should be on the lookout, regardless, baseball people. Well, th awesome. see, that's, that's ridiculous. So here's, this is going to be a compliment to you guys. You guys, and I'm, I'm on Fish Stripes uh, every day, and nobody on, on this, in this franchise is under the radar, thanks to you guys. I mean, this my is goodness, true. This is true. you know, like uh, giving, <laughs> you guys are giving love to people. Uh, you know, I don't even know that they're uh, in the organization. Go, Who the heck is this guy? And you guys have this, this whole setup with uh, everything about him and, you know, what his favorite food was when he was 12. And uh, I mean, the content that you guys put out there is fantastic. And I mean that. Um, no, I mean, listen, I, I don't want to single any one person out, um, but I, I will say that there's because there's no one that's under the radar, like I just said, but also there's just, there's so many different avenues that, that the Marlins could possibly go here. I mean, so it, like, I think more in terms of this time of the year, like kind of like position battles, like, you know, I mean, it, it, to, I don't want to look too far into the future and say, Hey, in 2027, this guy's going to be their all-star, um, you know, and you guys have done a fantastic job kind of looking into the crystal ball. But, you know, I look at the, those position battles, the second base position and, you know, how, how's the fifth starter going to shake out, like things like that. Like, it'll be interesting to see, um, you know, I know jazz has put together some good numbers. I know Isan Diaz got a nice little write up in baseball America the other day. Um, so that's going to be, that's going to be fun to watch and just kind of see how these guys continue to develop and, and how they, how they handle these, these types of springs, you know, where, you might be coming off, uh, um, maybe you're coming off a down year, or maybe you're trying to win a job. Like, so there's that, there's that internal pressure before, you know, within the organization or with yourself to earn, for example, let's just say that second base everyday job um, before the external pressure starts once the season begins. And now it's like, well, now I've got to do something to help my team beat the nationals and beat the Mets and the Braves and the Phillies and, and all kinds of stuff like that. So, um, 
Yeah. I mean, like I said, you guys do such a great job. I can't go under the radar too far. I mean, geez, you guys cover it all. My God, go to fishstripes.com. <laughs> I'm going to clip that from this recording. Use that that. Thank you, Paul. <laughs> oh, man, one, one other, well, one big question that, that I have for this upcoming season is for you, whether you'll be able to actually be with the team uh, throughout the entire year in 2021. Obviously last year, uh, the way it shook out, really the majority <laughs> of games last year for the Marlins, you had to call from afar on the monitors uh, because also the way that the schedule changed following right. the uh, COVID outbreak, they played more road games and home games. And they had some of their biggest moments on the road, uh, including, right. uh, I mean, you really stepped up in that key moment at Yankee Stadium when they clinched it. There it is. There it is after 17 years. Um, but doing it from a thousand miles away, have you, well, one, I guess, did you get more comfortable with that setup using the screens as the year went on? And uh, do you have any assurances this year that you'll be able to travel with the team as you normally would, you know, pre-pandemic? Uh, the way that it worked out last year was exactly how I thought it was going to work out was we did, uh, we were, you were right. We were at the ballpark every day, home games, obviously there were human beings in front of us and that, and that was normal. And we'd sit in our normal perch. And then when the Marlins were on the road, we were on the other side of the booth doing it off a monitor. And I thought, well, as soon as I get used to calling it off a monitor, the road trip's going to end. And then I'm going to have to get used to calling it with real people in front of us. And then once I get used to that, um, and then get used to the monitor thing and the real life thing. Once I get used to them both, the season's going to be over. And that's pretty much exactly what happened. Um, so it, it was different, but I will say it, um, I think without even really knowing it, um, just by happenstance, my time at MLB network kind of prepared me for last season. Um, just because, you know, when we would do MLB tonight, um, and live games are going on, you know, we have, you know, behind the cameras, we can see all the, all the games and we're watching seven, eight, nine, 10, 12 games at once. Um, and then once we kind of go into a live look, you know, if it's late in the game, I, I always like to step out of the way and, and let the, the broadcasters, uh, call it. And, you know, they've had a, a feel for the game and, you know, who might be up in the bullpen, stuff like that. So I would always say, all right, let's listen in live on MLB tonight and get out of the way. But if it's, you know, early in the game or middle innings, you know, we would always talk over the live look. And when we would do that, we're kind of doing a little bit of radio where it's, you know, big picture stuff that may or may not be pictures that are on the screen. And then sometimes if things would happen, bang, you got to break right into play by play. You know, you're, we're talking about something, but there's a, a grand slam happens. And you can't keep talking about, you know, their bullpen options as a, as a grand slams leave in the ballpark. So you have to break into play by play a little bit. And um, I think that that uh, paired with the fact that again, with MLB tonight, we had no control over any of the cameras or any of the pictures, right? Cause we're taking the Fox Florida feed or we're taking whatever, you know, SNY or whatever feed it was. Um, so you're just at the mercy of whatever those directors and producers decide to put up on the screen. And last year was the same sort of thing. I want to say that we had, um, six there were six cameras in the ballpark six or seven cameras in each ballpark and we personally uh fox florida had control over one of them so they uh, our, our guys in the truck who did a phenomenal job under crazy circumstances last year were able to kind of override the quote-unquote world feed and maybe take a shot if we're talking about don mattingly take a shot of don mattingly so that it makes it somewhat makes somewhat sense that uh, of what we're talking about um, so that, that kind of prepared me, I think for, for last year in terms of this year, <clears throat> um, I do not believe at least to start, we are not traveling, um, uh, with the team. Um, and I, I, listen, by the end of the year, uh, of the end of the season, I don't know how things will change, but, um, you know, I think, uh, and I, and I get it. I mean, it, um, hopefully it doesn't affect it too much, but, you know, not being able to chit chat with the players and, and coaches and manager and, um, you know, talk to them on the bus, uh, on the, on the plane or, you know, downstairs in the hotel, bump into them, grabbing a cup of coffee. Like you, you do miss out on those things. Um, and again, whether it's, whether it's something that I would talk to Pablo Lopez about, um, getting coffee in the morning, if that's something that was broadcast related, great. If that was just me asking him, 
about anything else that, that would never make it on air. It's, it's just those connections that we do miss out on. But I, I totally understand. I totally respect why, um, why we're not traveling. But to start, no, we're not traveling. Um, we'll see how, how this, the, the year goes. Um, but hopefully we, we do get a chance to go back out on the road a little bit. I guess the other thing that's timely as of this recording is that we're just days <clears> away <throat> from the official rebrands of the network into Fox Bally Sports Florida. Yeah, Bally Sports Florida. I'll have to get used to that. <laughs> so will I. Yeah, so will all of us, yeah. Uh, and, but just for people on the outside, just so they're not confused, that doesn't change your job description whatsoever no. as far as you know. <laughs> No, everything is the same <clears throat> in terms of that. Um, you know, it, it's the same channel number and everything else. Um, it's just a, it's just a rebrand. It's a new logo. It's new graphics. It's new music. Um, you know, like, like I, I tweeted out uh, the other day, I, I, or I retweeted it out. I said, "New look, same great taste." You know, so it's it's uh, a lot of, if not all of the same people uh, behind the scenes and in front of the camera and everything else. It's just, uh, it's just a, a rebrand and, um, and we're excited for it. Saw some of, saw some of what things are going to look like and sound like and feel like, and, uh, and it's cool. It's cool. And it, it, uh, it will be, uh, you know, obviously regionally, it's going to have a little bit of a different feel. Um, you know, we'll have Marlon's shots in it and, you know, in, in, Texas, they'll have Dallas Mavericks shots in there, little opens, but for the most part, there's kind of a, a really cool shell in it uh, for some of these opens and graphics and animations and stuff like that. And it's, uh, it's exciting. It looks cool. And saw it a few weeks ago and um, yeah, I was ready for opening day. <laughs> are you, are you, do you get like a special Bally sports card or something? Uh, again, not that I know of. You, you, you should be my agent. I, hey. I'm not giving you ten percent. That's for damn sure. But, hey, man, um, you're it, asking a lot of these good questions. I'm not greedy, man. That'll look good on my resume. <laughs> 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 hey, um, now nah, I can see the transition being uh, like first of all, I think all the fans are super happy that this deal's going through, and that we're gonna finally be able to see our Marlins baseball on TV again. Uh, we we feel like we got the short end of the stick. We've been limited to like a GoPro at times and, and like for, for baseball fiends, as you, you, you guys, everybody in this group and everybody listening, right. We're all big baseball fans. Like we're happy. We're content that we get to at least see that like myself. I, I think I'm like, you know what? We could probably just put on some like VR glasses and pretend we're at the Dean right now. And that's it. Like I'm going to enjoy the game. What could I tell you? Just enjoy like that. <laughs> Listen to Glenn on, on the radio or Kyle Seeloff and we take the best of, of what we can. That being said, it also feels really good to hear other media that the few times that we have been on TV, well, we, we played the Astros and AT&T did a, a good job with the broadcast and they were throwing us flowers. They were talking really good about the Marlins and it felt good. Like it wasn't like your typical, like, I don't want to throw dirt, but like the Mets were throwing a little bit of dirt at us. And it was like, come on, man. It, obviously it's because you're you're our rival but right that's a division thing but yeah i mean you make a good point i mean I, I know you mentioned the astros but that's the thing i mean look at where the astros were the astros lost like i think it was 300 games over the course of a three-year stretch and then um you know then now they're they're always seemingly in the playoffs or uh fight for a pennant or a world series like that i mean you know that you in order to experience joy you need pain i think that's a dmx line see i told you um <laughs> You know, so it's like uh, it, it, that, that, that's good. And I think like for me, like I, I'm not as a broadcaster, like I'm not in the business of wanting to go to a, a city or whatever thinking, oh, only Marlins fans are watching. So I can sit here and bury this team. They stink. They're terrible. This guy's awful. I hate their bullpen. Let's go Marlins. Like that, that to me, like that doesn't really serve the fan too much either. And, and maybe that just comes from, you know, my time at, at the, at the more national stops of ESPN and MLB network where, you know, I, there is certainly, uh, you know, that uh, a pro Marlins feel, I certainly hope uh, to, to my voice and on and our calls and stuff like that. But at the same time, I think that, you know, I knew that if I ever got a job like this, that, I wanted to make sure that the person at home uh, and you guys are dialed in, trust me, I know that, but there's a lot of folks at home that might only 
pay attention to baseball from seven to 10 every night and they're not on Twitter and they're not on 8,000 websites and they're not on fan graphs and they're not on baseball savant and they're not watching that kind of stuff. So they may not know an awful lot about Pete Alonso, even though we seem to know everything about Pete Alonso. So what good would it be? And listen, he, there's not much negative to say about the guy, but I'm just saying like what, from my perspective, what negative or, or what purpose would it serve for me to be negative about Pete Alonso on a Marlins broadcast, just because I'm broadcasting the Marlins fans, you know? So it's like, Hey, the guy's a special player. He's a really fun player to watch. And I say it all the time. Um, I say it about Freddie Freeman, like, and I, however I phrase it exactly, but I say something to the effect of respectfully, I cannot stand this guy anymore. You know, like, and I mean that, like, he's such a great ball player and he's such a good guy. Um, and, and so much fun to watch, um, from a distance. That's what I always say. He's so much fun to watch from a distance. Like you, you want to see the guy win the MVP or, uh, or win a batting title or something, just not because he doubles seemingly every first inning against the Marlins. Usually it's like with two outs and it just laces one into the gap. Like it's unbelievable. Like I'm, I'm just tired of seeing it. So again, I think that we, we are all baseball fans deep down. Um, and, and some of us are just more Marlins fans now than, than anything. But, um, you know, for example, like my first year, um, we were in DC and Max Scherzer was, was on the doorstep of, I think he needed 10 strikeouts that night to get to 300. And, you know, as it was going, I didn't really talk to my producer about it before, but I just, again, had just having the experience that I had, I thought, well, 300 strikeouts, that's a big deal. So that's kind of the storyline of this game. It was late in September. Marlins were kind of out of it. So, you know, to, to sit there and try to pretend like this was game seven of the world series is just not it. The storyline of the game was, is Max Scherzer going to get 300 strikeouts this year? Um, and with every one, you could sense a build in the ballpark and, and hopefully on the broadcast as well. And I, you know, he's probably at like four five, six strikeouts at the time. And I asked my producer on the talk back, I said, am I, am I, is it too much? Like, am I pumping it up too much? You know, cause he's on the other team and he goes, no, not at all. He goes, this is, this is potentially history here. And, and that's what we're here to do. We're here to document the game and, you know, we root for the Marlins, but if, if there's history to be made, we get excited for it. And, um, you know, and that was, that was really cool. The place was packed and, um, place was going nuts. And unfortunately he struck out Austin Dean for number 300, but um, you know, it was cool to just, I think I even, I even posted something about it that night. I remember it. Um, I can't remember what my wife says to get at the grocery store, but I remember that I Instagrammed something about appreciate greatness when it's in front of you. And I think that that's kind of the mindset that, that we have. I mean, we saw Jacob deGrom in four straight starts last year. What am I going to say bad about Jacob deGrom? seriously nothing so it's like just appreciate it and hope that the marlins can do something scrape together a few runs and um you know that his his blow-ups his seven run outings are few and far between you know you're going to be in for for a fight against him so just here's a thousand career notes for one of the best pitchers of our generation let's enjoy this next three hours and watch jacob de Grom work and and hope with all our heart that the Marlins are able to squeak something by. And they did for sure. in that one makeup game in the sixth inning last year in New York. And that was one of their, one of their uh, pivotal wins last year. So, you know, that, that's, that's kind of it. You know, like I said, I'm, I'm root for the Marlins every single night, but if, uh, if there's something great that's on the other side of the field, I want to appreciate and document that too. I, uh, I can tell you what's wrong with, uh, with Pete Alonzo and Jacob. <laughs> They're both mess. <laughs> yeah, see, jokingly, yeah, see, yeah, jokingly. right. No, but I give exactly, and I get that. I get that, and and hopefully, if I made a, a, a joke like that on the air, I would say it in such a way that people would understand that I still respect the hell out of these guys. Because, <laughs> and, and honestly, I've said this. I've probably said it on air. I've definitely said it off air. Like these guys, no matter how bad a guy might be going. That guy's worst day in the big leagues is way better than mine because I don't have any, you know. So it's like it, it's uh, that that's one of the areas where, as a broadcaster, you do have to separate your fandom a little bit, you know. Like you you do there is a line that you can cross um, where you don't want the fandom to overtake it. 
because at the same time, like, you know, if I did say something like that, hopefully, like I said, I would make light of it enough that people know that I'm just joking around. I've probably even said it to a couple of guys around the cage on opposing teams. Like, man, you're a lot of fun to watch, but I just can't wait for you to leave town. Like <sighs> something like that. Cause, cause they're, they're doing something that I couldn't dream of doing. Like I, I, uh, I played four years uh, of high school baseball and that's where the dream stopped for me. So it's like these guys, Oh, they can't catch up with 98. Yeah. Well, Paul, you couldn't catch up with 78. So why don't you just pipe down? <laughs> hey, what'd you play? What positions did you play? First base. Nice. First base. I, you remember, you remember Doug Menkevich? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I was my, I was like a Doug Menkevich type. I like to think of myself as a phenomenal defender, but um, didn't exactly put together big offensive numbers. I did have one career home run though. One career home run. And that was, uh, that was special because for the longest time going back to little league, even my, so my dad, um, when he met my mom, he, he had a mustache and my mom never saw him without a mustache. And he had a heart attack when I was like 18 months old or something like that. So he went to the hospital and he did not shave when he was there. So he had a beard. So as long as I remembered him, for the most part, not in pictures, but actually remembering him, he had a beard. And I said, dad, as I got older, I said, dad, can you shave your beard? I've never seen you without a beard. And he goes, I'll shave my beard if you hit a home run. Little league goes by, pony league goes by, senior year of high school, I finally hit a home run and he shaved his beard. Nice. But he, he said, I'm not getting rid of the mustache. <laughs> so funny. It's a great feeling, huh? When you hit that home run. Yeah, especially because I, I didn't know like really what to do. I, I think I might have missed first base. Um, I definitely made an error at first the next inning. Like I just did, I was on cloud nine. What'd you, what'd you hit it to? Uh, left field. Nice. Left field. And uh, between us, the jury's still out if it got over the fence or if it rolled under the fence. We're not quite sure. <laughs> by, the time, by the time the left field, we didn't have stat cast back then. Um, but yeah, by the time the left fielder got to it or the umpire ran out there or something, it was on the other side of the fence. But I, I remember there being some, some mumblings and rumblings that perhaps it had rolled under. I'm not, I'm not sure, but it was it, whatever it went over. It was, um, it was an upper deck shot. How about that? I'm out of here. <laughs> Severino with the shot to the left field. That ball's going back. It's gone. Or it's under the wall. I don't know, but he's running around the bases. He Who missed cares? first base. He yeah. missed first base. <laughs> I was like, I was like Mark McGuire on number 62. Like, I feel like I had to, I think I got it with like my back foot on the way by, but I remember my best friend when I got the home plate, you know, the whole team comes out and they're slapping me high five. And my friend, he gets in my face and he goes, what the hell was that? I go, I don't know. <laughs> Wasn't exactly a power hitter. Hey, you kind of, <laughs> hey, you kind of gave me like a, like, I know you said Doug McCavage, but you kind of got, got me to like the John Olerud vibes. Yeah, I mean, I didn't wear a helmet on the field, but um, yeah, I, I could see that too. I could see that, yeah. But I, I was, I was, a, I was a better defender. I was better on defense than offense. How about that? That that's that's how we'll put it. And I and I say this too. I liken it. I liken myself to Doug Mankiewicz because when I was a kid in uh, in Connecticut, every Friday when the New Britain Rockcats, the double A affiliate of the twins had a game, my dad and I would go and sit by first base and I would watch Doug play every Friday night for the year or two that he was in New Britain. And I, and I just loved him. He was so slick around the bag. And um, when that whole group, when it was Minkiewicz and Torrey Hunter and Jock Jones and uh, all those guys graduated to, to the major leagues um, and ended up getting to the ALCS, in whatever year that was or two or three, something like that. Um, it was awesome. Cause it was like, I watched these guys all the time. So I'm up close and personal and here they are in the big leagues. And you know, those guys were cornerstones of, of that twins team for a few years. All right. Well, we're about to get going over here. We're going to get ready for the final segment of Marley's barbecue. We're going to introduce you to uh, this or that. You ever heard of this or that? It's a world famous little segment that we have here I, I'm, I'm excited to take part in it for the first time yeah it's supposed to be pretty much rapid fire but i know you're not a rapid type of person i will try but... to be rapid as rapid as i possibly can be 
All right. Well, we'll be the judge of that. Yeah, so, right. Alex, I know. Alex, go ahead. All right. More swag. Monte or Jazz? Oh, geez. You swinging. Um, <laughs> I'm going to say Monte. All right. The spring training jerseys or the batting practice jerseys? You mean like those Miami blue ones? Yeah, the ones that they never wear in the season. <laughs> right, yeah. <laughs> you can't um, fail. You can't fail. Hashtag wear blue, never lose. Right, yeah, I know. That's the thing for you guys. Um, I do like the blue ones. I do like the blue ones. Uh, I'll go with the blue. Yeah, it was. I was setting you up. There was no fail because they're both like they're both the blue. <laughs> they're both the <laughs> Miami blue. Yeah, exactly. So you just want me to say that they should be wearing them more often during the season? Can you get? Can you like push the buttons? Can you move some Zoom calls? Talk, you know, what I'm saying, talk Man, some you smack. You give me way too much credit. Come talk on. some smack around the, the 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 cages. Hey, what's up, guys? Dang, y'all should wear those in the season. Translate <laughs> some more W's. You know, I don't even care. know. Honestly, I think I think part of it's up to the starting pitcher that gets to choose. But I don't know, um, like if if that blue is even in the rotation for a game jersey. I don't even know how that works. Can you? What's up with that? Nah, man, we're gonna get off subject. See, so that. much for the red rapid <laughs> fire. <laughs> lasted two questions. Hey, what are we gonna do? Like, how, how, we can't have a throwback this year. If they're not gonna put it, the the blues in rotation, they might as well have a throwback. Can you? Can I, you I push don't those know. buttons? I, I I can ask, but I can't make anything happen. That's really all I can do. I don't know. Teal era or current era? Oh, geez. The teal era had the championships, but the blue era seems to be brighter for a longer extended period of time. So I'm going to go with the current. My man. Yeah. You going uh, steaks or ribs at the barbecue? Oh, that's a good one. Because I figured out how to nail a hanger steak. Nail it. Uh, I'm going to go with the steak just because it's uh, it doesn't take six hours. What type of cut is it? Uh, it's the, it's just, it's a hanger steak. And you, uh, what I do is uh, for like a half hour, 45 minutes before little oil on there. And then um, yeah, one of the, one of the rubs that I've got on, just like sprinkle that on, let it sit, let it get to room temperature and then just sear it, sear it until it gets to like 125 and then take it off, and it's glorious. Well, you, what's, your, what's your go-to spot? Where are you buying the steaks? Are you going like Sedano's, Publix? You, I like, you know what I like? I like Wild Fork. I do Wild Fork down here. The frozen, the frozen uh, meats and stuff. Awesome, awesome. I got, I got one in the corner of my house here in Thoreau. I'm going to go check it out. Yeah, do it. They got so much stuff. It's not like we'll walk in and walk out of there, and it's like 70 bucks for like six dinners worth of meat. So, so what, what are you bringing to the barbecue since we're on that subject? <laughs> I guess I'm bringing the steaks. Yeah. Bringing the steaks. You know, you know, I can't believe Andy Slater was talking about he was going to bring chicken because he thought it was, uh, oh, I'll bring chicken if it's like a thing right now. I was like, hey, man, we got to wait on the steaks and we wait on the steaks. But... Well, maybe I'll ask it, <laughs> how many people are there? Because if it's steak, if there's a lot of people, steak might get a little costly. Hey, man, it's just a cool, it's just, it's a cool <laughs> little, no more than nine people. All right, fine. It's a CDC approved gathering, then steaks. <laughs> you're drinking uh, your choice of a beverage. You're going beer or you're going liquor? Uh, around the grill, I, sometimes I'll just crack open like a Corona around the grill. I, I'm, a, I'm a simple man. But I did, I did stumble upon this. It's a little healthy too, actually, which is great. At Costco, letting you in behind the curtain, at Costco, they've got, you know, the suja juice, that cold pressed uh, vegetable juice. Have you seen that? It, the suja is the brand, but one of the things is uh, it's like an immunity booster. It's like a really healthy orange juice. It's got coconut in there and mango and pineapple. Put that in there with a little bit of the Rocks Terramana tequila. Oh, my on. That is like awesome. Just mix that up a little bit. That's good. That's, that's, that's fresh. I like that. Hey, that sounded like a whole snippet. Like a, you could cut that up for a, promo a promotion. <laughs> If I get a case of the Terramana in my house, then that's good. <laughs> well, guys, uh, that's it for this episode of Marlins Barbecue. We want to thank Paul Severino for joining us. Paul, thank you so much. And my uh, pleasure. Good to talk with you guys. And hopefully we see you around the ballpark soon. Well, 
For more inciting information and content, visit fishstripes.com, marlins.com. I'm Alex Contreras alongside Eli Sussman and Paul Severino signing out. Everybody stay safe and go fish. <laughs>